afternoon, everyone. My name is Dominique Valjur, and welcome to Thrive Together Personal Finance Wellness Summit. We are so happy that you are here with us. Today's part A of our summit. It's Q&A panel with some money experts. And joining me today is my colleague, uh, AVP Migdalia Gomez. I am the Community Engagement Specialist. And Migdalia will be in and out. Uh, she'll jump in and she'll also share some of her expertise as well. And uh, we will be using the Q&A feature. So um, just also wanted to get started and see where's everybody calling us from? Let's see. You guys can start putting that in the Q&A. But before we get started, I wanted to let everybody know that uh, we will be muting the background. So if you have a child or a pet making any noises, we won't be able to hear them. So um, put in the Q&A where you're joining us from. I'd like to know where all of our members uh, are joining us from. Let me take a peek over here. Let's see. Hmm. OK, no one's timing in yet. Well, in the meantime, I'm going to keep going. We also have a closed captioning on. So if you want, you can take that off as well. All right. And uh, this presentation is being recorded. So in case you missed any portion and if you um, like to you know, play it again at your own time, you can go on our YouTube channel at my H-U-E-C-U and you can rewatch it at your convenience. And then at the end, when we're done, uh, we have a post-workshop survey. Uh, you could just take that at just a few minutes of your time, letting us know how we did, how we're doing, how we can do it better, just to make sure that we are meeting um, any of your needs. And Hi, uh, before I'm Hi. saying uh, in the chat, we are getting some Ooh. people that are learning, joining from Virginia, Michigan, awesome. Boston, a variety uh, of different people, California, Salt Lake City, wow, California. Georgia. It's kind of so early there. <laughs> Thank you, Magdalia. Wow, California, that's real early. Thank you for getting up that early uh, to join us and everyone else uh, who is participating here today. And uh, before we also get started, uh, just for participating here today, we have some great prizes for you. You are automatically entered um, in some of our um, prizes. And one of them is a $100 Spa Finder gift card. We have a year subscription to 10% Happier app. And we also have HUECU swag that um, you can get. Um, so we're going to do this and we'll probably let you know an email will go out uh, next week or so. So, um, all right, let's get started. So what's the difference between a bank and a credit union? Well, for one thing, um, our motto here at HUECU is not a, a bank, but a, pro a benefit. So why is it a benefit? Well, whatever kind of profits that we make, any savings we have, we pass it on to our members and we solely exist because of our members. And once you're a member, you're a member for life. And it's also uh, your family members, your spouse, your children, they too can become members um, of the credit Credit union, and we have a variety of different um, uh, services and products that uh, we have available for you from, you know, a checking account to savings account, CDs, loans, a variety um, of different things. And then we can, you can access us anywhere uh, from online to any of our ATMs, as well as coming in person to uh, one of our branches. And um, this seminar is a two-parter. So today we're having it from noon until one o'clock. Um, like I said before at the beginning, the title of today's uh, webinar is called Q&A Panel with Money Experts. And to this afternoon, again, from one until 2 p.m., introducing Thrive, your financial education resources, where Migdalia and I will take over and uh, we will also walk you through that. And it's going to be on the same Zoom. So if you want to stick around and join us, it's the same link. And then part two is tomorrow, again, two-parter, uh, segment A and segment B, and that's household finances simplified, as well as your money and your mind. So let's get started. We're going to meet today's panelists. It is Patrick Donnelly. So Patrick is a senior wealth advisor and principal of the Colony Group. Hi, Patrick. And he's also a certified financial planner. 
He's been doing this for about 15 years, um, and he is in counseling high net worth uh, individuals as well as families in the area and wealth management. And Patrick and his team, they deliver a vast array of relevant services, including investment management, tax planning, multi-generational uh, gifting and wealth transfers, family worth, uh, wealth rather, education, philanthropic advice and advising business owners on exit planning. And our second uh, panelist today is our very own HUECU's Deb Johnny Ray. And hi, Deb Johnny. Well, she has over 20 years experience in banking and uh, she's been with us for about three years or so. And if you wanna find her, you can find her at the MGH branch. She kind of goes all over the place, but MGH is where she is there all the time. And so she's passionate about her members and she likes to help her, them as well as her team. And she is married to Sabruta and she is a mother of two. And one of the things she likes to do when she's not banking, she likes to uh, listen to music, cook, my favorite thing to do, as well as travel. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, and you guys, the floor is yours. We'll start off with the first question. So how do I create an effective budget? So Deb, you want to take that one? So you're on mute, we can't yeah, hear you. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> there we go, yeah, thank you. Yes, yes. So for creating a budget, you know, first thing is we have to calculate really our net income and we have to track our spending. And, you know, we have to make sure that we get realistic goals and 50% uh, of our income should really go into, you know, paying our bills, we have no choices, we have to do that. After other 50%, you know, 30% is our wants and 20% is, you know, saying, saving or paying our debt. So where we can, where can we really, you know, cut a little, the budget is that, is the wants and the needs that, you know, maybe today do I need to, I buy coffee every month, right? Every day. Can I buy coffee maybe once a week and, you know, get coffee from home? Maybe that way I can save a little more and budget myself. So that way, you know, we are in a better position because savings is, you know, we have to, no matter what we make, we have to, in our budget savings, we have to put little money towards the savings. That That's helps. right. All right. Thank you so much, Deb. Our next question, should we be concerned with inflation and market volatility or is it in hyperbole? Patrick? Wow. So that's a, a very... Um topical question these days. It seems like everywhere we look, um, we're reading about inflation and what's happening with the market. Um, so, you know, I don't think it's exaggerated. It's, uh, I'll get into a little detail about both of these items, inflation and market volatility sort of separately, but I, I think they're, they're very much linked. Um, so, you know, inflation, it, it's very concerning. I mean, in my opinion, it was triggered by the pandemic. You know, COVID disrupted many people's lives, including the supply chains, which we keep hearing ad nauseum about, um, and the stimulus that was put into place in order to help us um, through the pandemic gave many people extra cash, which, you know, we then spent, uh, despite this, this budget that Dr. Johnny was saying, we need to create and save. I think a lot of people spent a lot of that money. Um, and that prompted you know, more demand um, when there wasn't as much supply, which then drives prices higher. So, um, and that recently I think has been exacerbated by what's been happening um, still with COVID in China, where China takes a very strict policy around COVID and they'll just lock down entire cities, including key manufacturing plants, which has disrupted uh, supply chains. And then also um, what's going on in Russia and Ukraine um, has dramatically impacted food and energy prices. So it's, it's um, a lot of different things are impacting inflation. And so now the question becomes, you know, how do we reverse that trend? And you've probably have been hearing about the Federal Reserve trying to combat it by aggressively increasing interest rates. That has investors worried that um, the Fed might overshoot it and, and, and the economy might be in for a rough landing um, if they go through that. And in the meantime, you know, consumers are dealing with $5 per gallon gas at the pump and larger uh, receipts from the grocery store. 
and, and other impacts on their budget. So um, I, I don't think it's exaggerated. I, I do think it's concerning. Um, there are some um, you know, silver linings out there right now, um, but it's really, I think, too early to tell whether or not we've sort of hit peak inflation for right now and things will start to soften. So I think stay tuned and be careful with your budgets. And as I mentioned before about market volatility, this one may be a little bit more exaggerated. Um, you know, these drawdowns, as we call them in the industry, should be expected, but they're never easy. Um, you know, market, the term volatility suggests, you know, ups and downs, right? Both. But investors don't usually complain when the market goes up 3% or, or, or even pay attention, maybe. But when the market goes down 3%, you know, the sky is falling and everybody's very concerned and, and anxious. So um, what I would say is that um, you know, an, an average sell-off in the marketplace is probably around 14% if you're paying attention to, you know, what the indices are doing. That's the S&P 500 index, which is the largest 500 companies in the United States. And, um, but, but, but during the last 50 plus years of market history, um, the market has ended the calendar year positive about 75% of the time. So if you think about that, it's, you know, the market can go down 14% and then back up. And it's that sort of wave, that roller coaster that we're riding. And if you can stay disciplined um, to an investment strategy, uh, then you can achieve the long-term average annual returns that we would expect from, from the marketplace. So it's, it's really about being disciplined. Um, one, one other thing I'll say is that what, what makes the current environment um, more concerning, I guess, is that we haven't had a 14% sell-off in the equity markets. We've actually, as of yesterday, had a 20% sell-off in the equity markets. And 20% is this, this uh, hurdle that we refer to as a bear market, um, which you may have heard of. And um, those can take longer to recover from historically. Uh, and you know, on the average, could be about two years for the market to recover from a bear market. Um, so, so I, you know, I, I think volatility should be expected as investors. We should, we should know it's going to happen. We should try to prepare for it. Um, and when it does happen, try not to get too upset. Um, that, but that's easier said than done. Right. So I, those, those are my comments there. Yeah. That's a tough one. <laughs> yeah. All right. We're going to move on to the next question. Uh, what are solid investment vehicles uh, during a recession? I guess this is the one that I'm sure you can answer, Patrick. Sure. Yeah. I guess it kind of segues from, you know, our, our my, the comments I just had on, on volatility. Um, you know, I, so I think at the outset, it's really important that every investor have a defined strategic asset allocation that they developed based on their goals timeline and risk tolerance. So asset allocation is the biggest determinant of future returns. Um, so getting the mix right is key. Um, mm -hmm. Most investors allocate between stocks, bonds, and cash, um, but there are non-traditional investments like real assets and alternative investments, which can play a role too. Um, so, you know, for example, an aggressive investor may allocate 90 to 100 percent of their investment assets in stocks um, because stocks have historically provided the most return. And on the other side of the spectrum, a conservative investor may allocate only 20 percent of their investments to stocks um, and instead put the bulk of their investments in things like bonds, which produce uh, income uh, and more relative safety. Um, so, so I think, you know, it's during a recession, there's a tendency to want to move into more conservative investments when the market goes down. Um, but then that sort of has the effect of selling things after they've gone down in value um, that had a potential for growth and then moving into things that have less potential for growth, which can be troubling from a long-term standing plan, uh, planning standpoint. Um, so be careful about trying to market time, but, you know, that said, I, I do think adjustments to portfolios can be warranted, uh, when the market is moving around, um, currently in this environment, uh, I would say, uh, for investors, they could be looking at dividend paying companies, you know, large, stable, 
uh, US-based companies um, that focus more in um, cyclical areas. So that's like consumer staples, think like, um, um, you know, like toilet paper and toothbrushes and um, groceries, and then also like utilities, because um, everyone needs energy and, and, uh, or financials, because everyone needs banking services. So these companies tend to be more stable uh, and tend to perform better in recessionary environments. And then also what I would say, Dominique, is that um, real assets, which I, I mentioned earlier, those are like real estate, natural resources, um, infrastructure investments, those can be a good hedge against inflation risk. Um, and right now there are some regulatory tailwinds um, that support things like renewable energy that make infrastructure um, a more attractive investment as well. So, you know, if I needed to offer a couple of tidbits on what to do during a potentially recessionary environment, I think that those would be that. All right. Thank you so much, Patrick. Sure. Um, now, next question, how can I stay out of debt and build credit? Deb. So um, that's a really, you know, it's about, again, how we budget ourselves. So to stay out of debt is, you know, I think a lot of people, they, what they do is they use cash. It's good to use cash so they don't go into credit cards and, you know, they don't want to overspend. So there's two sides on that. So the yes, you're never going to be in debt, but you're also never going to be be able to build credit. So this is like a two, you know, sided question. So you should, if you don't use a debit card or a credit card or take some loans, you're never going to be able to build your credit. I see members here who come in and they use cash for everything and they want to take a loan with us, but I'm not able to give them a loan because they have no lending, you know, history. So it is, I would advise that you take advantage of the credit cards and you know take but you have to be super careful when you use a credit card please don't like max them out and don't um you know pay the minimum interest this is what i advise to everybody take a credit card and i personally do this i never have cash on me i have one credit card i do everything from coffee to my groceries to big but big purchases i use one credit card and then i pay it back at the end of the month. So I get, not only is my credit building, but I also get cash back for using my money. So that's a great way of staying in budget. Do not, when we go to these stores, they always offer you, oh, do you want 10% cash back for opening a credit card? Opening, it's not going to hit your credit, but you know, I would again advise if you really don't need a card, there is no need to open one because you know, they do, hit our credit. So, you know, being a little careful on what we are just being told, because every time you go and apply for a credit card, it hits your credit score. And when you have a lot of open credit cards, maybe you're not using them, but when you again go to apply for a mortgage or something, all that is taken into consideration. Ah, good, good, I, good one. Thank you so much, Deb. Uh, the next one is, what is the best way to tackle paying down debt? So if you have a lot of debt, now it depends, you have to, it's the best thing is to create like an Excel spreadsheet. You can see and then write down the amount and what's your interest rate and what you owe on. It's a very good thing is to first pay down the debt that you have more interest on. Because you could be paying $500 a month on a credit card, but guess what? Most of it is going into your interest. And I see a lot of members who come in and they say, Deb, I've been paying for two years and my principal is still not going down. So a very good, best, good way of tackling it down it is to see what we um, you know, owe. But also when in doing this, we also have to remember that you also have other minimum payments, right? So you have to make sure you make your minimum payments, trying to make this credit card go down. You don't want to forget about those because if you don't pay down, you know, make your minimum payments, then it's going to hit your credit score. But, uh, and then budgeting yourself, like if you can pay, if you don't need to use the credit card, if you can be paid back, then better is, you know, not to kind of use the credit card and max it down. So you can actually stay in your budget. 
Ah, and also, uh, thank you so much, Devin. Just a FYI, all HU ECU members are eligible for free credit and debt counseling with Green Pass, Green Path Financial Wellness. So that's something that uh, is available for all of our members. And you can also view um, our debt repayment and credit card webinars uh, on YouTube at myyoutube.com. It's um, slash myhecu. So we're going to continue on with the next question. Do you have tips on how to get the same financial page with your partner, Patrick? Oh, wow. That's, that's a tough one. So it is. Yeah. You know, it's funny. So, you know, Deb, you're going through your comments on, you know, budget and debt and, and credit and, and all of that. I mean, I think when you form a relationship with somebody, I think inevitably there's going to come a time when um, the financial aspects of your life are going to need to be communicated and shared I think, um, you know, everyone's relationships are, are different and relationships evolve uh, over time. Um, but I would say, like, you know, if you're in a, um, a committed, trusting relationship with someone else, then the way I think about it is try to practice what um, is called peership. And, and peership is, uh, you know, being in a relationship uh, with a sense of mutual respect, voice, opinion, feedback, understanding, you know, regardless of hierarchy, such as like age or gender or educational background or career choice. So for example, uh, partner one is an older male with a finance background. And then partner two is a younger female with a uh, science background. You know, it's, it shouldn't just be assumed that we fall into these roles where the person with the financial background is the one making financial decisions. Like it, there should be the ability to come together, ask questions, and listen, and say things to your partner like, what do you think? How could we do this differently? Um, what are your priorities? Um, how am I doing as a partner in this relationship. If you can start to have conversations like that, um, I think it really opens things up. And then once you brainstorm together, then you can develop, you know, an action plan and agree on who's implementing what. And, you know, and if, and if there's differing goals and perspectives, then, you know, be opening, be open to exploring them um, and finding some, you know, mutually agreeable common ground. It's, it's easier said than done, but I do think when you're in a committed, trusting relationship, I think open communication and dialogue is, is really key and not, um, um, falling into these stereotypical roles in relationships. I think that can be sort of toxic. I don't know. Yeah. I could try a wedge. <laughs> that, that about the peership, Patrick, that is just so important that when you get in a relationship just after the, you know, the special days when the reality, you should, it's good to have a little reality check and, you know, sit down and have a conversation about, you know, what their priorities are, right? And what are their financial needs? They, you, like you said, they could have different goals, but, you know, come to common grounds. So, you know, their relationship really works better because a lot of time, you know, it comes down to that, the finances. That's right. And it's, it's very common in relationships for there to be some disparity in either um, background or, um, or income. Uh, you, know, you might have like a working spouse and a non-working spouse, for example, and, and um, that can create you know, some tension and, and discomfort. And I think it needs to be talked out. It's really the best way to address it. Great. Thank you so much. Um, our next question, uh, where should I save for my child's college education? Who wants to take that one? I, I can start. Um, Devin, okay. Feel free to jump in. I mean, one of the things that, um, you know, we often recommend for people saving for a goal like that um, are what's called a 529 plan. You may have heard of this before. Um, 529 it refers to, I, I think, a section of the IRS code, which is you know, incredibly complicated. But, um, but basically, it's a college savings account where um, you can put money into it and it can be invested and then it can grow. And the appreciation 
would be tax free if the dollars were used for qualified expenses. So think of it as um, you know an opportunity to put money into a dedicated account that could then be invested. We often see people using these um, what are called target date funds, where where it starts uh, very aggressive when the child is very young and their timeline is longer for them to go to college. And then once they get to college age or start approaching college age, um, the asset allocation gets more and more conservative to protect the money as they get closer to when they're going to actually need it. Um, so it, it tends to be a, a good way to to invest or, or save uh, for funding college and, um, and, and tax savvy as well. There might even be some tax benefits for putting the money in. It depends on uh, the state that you live in, um, whether there's any state uh, tax incentives for contributions uh, to a 529 plan. And then the thing that I always tell people, it's like any sort of goal planning and Deb, I'm sure you do this a lot too, uh, at the credit union, you know, try to think ahead to these goals when they're off in the future. And then maybe even start small, just like start like regular automated small contributions, just start soon, get a program going sort of out of sight, out of mind. Next thing you know, you're going to look up and you're going to have this big account with money in it um, for college. Whereas if you kind of wait to the last minute, the goal seems much harder to achieve and likely is. We, we offered the, it's called like a custodian minor accounts, you know, where the you know, child is the minor, but you know, actually has the ownership of the account and they know they cannot take money out of it. They just, you know, whenever it's, I, when I was in my other bank and even here when I see kids, you know, we advise them that, you know, even sometimes the birthday money that they give, they have tremendous pride that they have a passbook sometimes, you know, they come in and they, instead of just, you know, buying things here and there, putting that money into that account so that you know they have a little savings when they even for maybe it's not as good as 529 but you know it can every bit helps like you said you know for you know books and stuff like that have a little separate savings account yeah absolutely um and then you know just keep an eye on the news too um so for example there was um, a recent adjustment in the law enacted that that changes um, how um, grandparents' money for, for college education is factored into the FAFSA application, which is for uh, financial aid. And so they're becoming increasingly, um, it's becoming increasingly more advantageous for grandparents to help pay for grandkids' education. So as you're getting into multi-generational conversations, um, it's really important to, to think of those things uh, too. So um, just thought I'd mention that as well. But like I said, with any, you know, whether it's college education, um, and I know we're, you know, we're going to talk about other goals too, probably, for, you know, shortly, you know, ha spending the time to think about your goals and objectives at a time when you're sort of calm and clear headed, and then setting forth a plan, even if it's only incremental steps, I think you'll, your future self will be very happy if you get started sooner rather than later. What is the 529 grandparent uh, deal? What, what is that? Yeah, so, so basically anyone can open a, one of these education accounts for anyone else. So you can you know, name, open up an account in your name and have it be for the benefit of anyone that you want. Um, and the, 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 the way the financial aid system works is they view parent owned assets and child owned assets differently than how they will view grandparent owned assets. It used to be that if um, your grandfather opened a 529 plan for you, that when money was taken out of the 529 plan to pay for education expenses, that distribution was considered uh, income to the student, the beneficiary, and then reportable in the FAFSA, which would hurt your ability to get financial aid. And now they're gonna do away with that. So basically mm -hmm. the, the money in the account is not factored into the FAFSA anymore and distributions from the account are not factored into FAFSA anymore. There's more to it um, than that because schools don't just um, use FAFSA for financial aid. There's other things that they look at too, but um, I just wanted to use it as an example of how, you know, 
really with any plan, you can't just set it and forget it because things change. So, so a big part of planning is monitoring and sort of keeping up to date on what's happening in the world, rule changes, law changes, things like that. And that was just, you know, one example, but, um, but yeah, does that answer the question, Dominique? Oh, it does. It does. Okay. I just wanted to elaborate for anyone who may be at home going, what is that? Yeah. And how can we, you know, talk to our grandparents about this? Yeah, it's not a different account. It's the same type of account. It's just the fact pattern is, you know, the grandparent owns it for the benefit of the grandchild as opposed to the parent owning it for the benefit of their child. Um, yep. One other thing, too, I guess I'll, I'll mention here is, you know, in terms of like behavioral finance, um, and we were talking about credit and using credit cards to build credit, but not getting yourself into trouble from a budget standpoint. Um, there are um, opportunities out there uh, where you could, for example, have a credit card that you um, earn points for using, you know, for your spending. And then you could have those points uh, deposited into a 529 plan for the beneficiary. So it's one way of like additional forced savings uh, into a 529 plan for, for your child or your grandchild. So, and, and uh, you know, getting back to the education accounts, you know, anyone can make a deposit into anyone else's 529 plan. There's even all these little tools they have available where like, you know, if it's someone's birthday or at the holidays where you could, um, you know, suggest a donation into their 529 plan instead of getting them that, that toy that they'll use for a week and then it ends up on a shelf someplace. Okay, good deal. The tips for uh, parents out there. Um, our next question, probably both of you can answer that one as well. Where should I save for a down payment if I'm not ready to buy a home until maybe five plus years from now? Deb? Yeah. <laughs> so we can be really, you should put the money into like a, either like a high yield savings account, which is earning you interest, or you can put it into a short term CD, it doesn't have to be like a long term CD. Um, because you know you want your money to grow a little bit. You don't want to put the money into a fund where you can't have access to it. Like you know, if there are penalties on the money. Say you saw uh, something, you need, needed the money for the house. You don't want to put it into somewhere where there's a lot of penalties for withdrawing the money. So high yield savings account is a good idea, definitely. There are short-term CDs, like right now, we do have two CDs, like 11 month and 15 month, which is really, you know, giving you good interest. Maybe then they can put it into those short-term CDs and not pay a penalty on it. What do you think, Patrick? Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, for, for goals like that, and it's a tough question because it says five plus years. So I mean, right. if, it's, if it's 10 years, if it's 15 years, then, you know, maybe the um, decision changes. but you know, just to help people sort of unset expectations, um, you know, I, I think with a goal, like a first time home purchase or, or down payment on, you know, an upgrade of a, of a house, if you're trying to get from your first house to your second house, that, that's a really important big goal that you, you probably don't want to take too much risk with the money that you're, you're marking for that goal. That's, you know, if it was like a fancy vacation that you were saving for, and, you know, if some, for some reason, like the start of this year, the market's down 20% and then you couldn't take that vacation, you know, big deal. You defer it for a year or two, right? But when you're trying to buy a house, that's that's a harder one to um, take risk with. So I think okay. that's absolutely right. You know, looking for things that offer um, principal protection, even at uh, modest um, yields uh, is is a, is a safe way to go. And then just in terms of help, helping people set expectations. So for example, if you had a portfolio and your asset allocation was half stocks and half bonds, right? So you decided, okay, five plus years, I'm going to invest and I'm going to invest in a balanced way, as maybe you'd call it. So half stocks and half bonds. You can have a range of returns uh, of anywhere from like negative 15% to positive 30% on an asset allocation like that um, over any, you know, one year period going back 75 years, that would be the range during any one year period. But once you get out to five years, then the range of those like rolling returns I was talking about, it narrows and it goes to like 
zero to 20% from down 15 to up 30. So that's why, you know, timeline and asset allocation are so directly linked. If you have a goal that's in the future, well into the future, you can take more risk and you can invest more into stocks to try to get that higher return. But when you're looking at goals that are zero to five years, really tricky, depending on what the goal is to invest with confidence because anything can happen in the market at any time. So I just think it's important for people to understand, you know, if, if you go into a CD or a high yield savings account and you're getting 1%, you might say to yourself, oh, that's only 1%. I'm never going to achieve my goal. Um, but if you were in all bonds to start this year, you said, I'm going to be conservative. I'm just putting it all in bonds. Your bond portfolio could be down eight or 9% right now with what's happening in the bond market. So it's just, it's good for people to kind of have those expectations of what could happen and probably better to play it safe with something like a down payment. Okay. And also, uh, Deb Johnny had mentioned talking about the CD. So just wanted to remind people, if you wanted to learn more about it, the certificate of deposit uh, special rate, go to our website, huecu.org. Uh, so our next question, if I already have an emergency fund and I am contributing to a retirement plan, what do I do next, Patrick? Um, <laughs> the look on yeah. your face says a lot. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a good question. I mean, you could take that in a lot of different ways. Uh, you know, I, to me, I think I would start with just evaluating my short to intermediate term goals. So, you know, if I have the emergency fund, I'm contributing enough to my retirement plan to maximize what my employer may offer me in terms of their own contributions to the plan. Oftentimes employers will do matching or profit sharing contributions. So make sure you're taking advantage of that. And then you're sort of like, okay, well, I have extra, I've done my budget. I have extra money that I can save. What should I do with them? I would start with those short to intermediate term goals. Do I, am I saving up for a down payment? Am I saving up for, um, you know, college for, or, or education expenses? Am I saving up for um, a renovation on the house? You know, th things like that. You know, where should my cash go? Um, the other thing that I think about too, and, I, and I'm not sure exactly what um, our audience looks like, so it's hard to sort of point these things, but um, is uh, the Roth IRA. I don't know if people have heard of the Roth IRA, but you know, to me, this is sort of like a unicorn uh, of investing accounts. Um, you can uh, you can withdraw your contributions from a Roth IRA at any time. You know, tax free, penalty free. It's just the earnings that if you take them out too soon, there's all these rules, so you have to look up the rules. Right. So if you take out the earnings or the growth, then you can run into some taxes or penalties. Um, but the Roth IRA, if you're eligible and the phase out, if you're a single taxpayer is like $130,000 a year of income and the phase out, if you're married, filing jointly is like $200,000 of income. So if you're under those income limits, you can put $6,000 into a Roth IRA and then all the appreciation is tax-free. So to me, it's like, if you had money that you're like, I just don't need it. I want to invest it for the future. If you're eligible for a Roth, you should really look at the Roth IRA. It's a, it's a wonderful investing tool. Um, we talked about paying down debt, you know, before managing debt, like that could be another place to put some capital potentially, you know, especially high uh, interest debt. Um, if you're thinking about making extra payments about your mortgage, just, you know, think about that a little bit, depending on the rate. You know, we just went through a time period where interest rates were incredibly low. So if your interest rate is rock bottom, you might not want to um, aggressively pay that down. And then you could always open just like a regular brokerage account. So that would just be, you know, like an investment account and start buying investments and you can stick with, you know, we could spend another hour just talking about what you could do in, in a brokerage account. And then Deb also mentioned um, like a custodial account for a kid, you know, you could maybe put a little bit of money into a custodial account for one of your children. So Lots of different things. But I think to me, I think of like, what are the next goals coming and making sure I'm contemplating them. Um, and then just in terms of like a tip, I would say, look up the Roth IRA, see if you're eligible. That might be another great place to put some money. All right. Um, let me check. So we have about uh, another 20 minutes to go. Um, so let's uh, try to see if we can get a few more questions in. Uh, what tips do you have for people approaching retirement? Um, 
I guess a little bit, both of you can answer this, uh, Patrick or Deb. Deb, do you want me to go first or do you want to go yes. first? Sure. <laughs> this is a question. Okay. Wow. Um, so that's, that's a big one, right? So I think, you know, that's a huge life event. You know, you're going to be shifting from this long period of time where you've been working, saving, funding these big life things, maybe raising children. I mean, like there's a lot happening in your life from when you graduate from college to when you contemplate retirement. And then when you contemplate retirement, it can have this big change in your lifestyle that can be really hard for people to adjust to. Many, many people now are, are sort of not calling it retirement anymore. They're trying to call it something else, like my next phase or, you know, whatever. Um, but I think the most important thing to do is get organized and get organized well in advance of making any sort of decision. So, um, you know, Deb talked about a budget. You know, I think you should review your budget, update your budget, start to think about what it might look like in retirement. Um, you know, update your balance sheet, make sure you know exactly what you have in terms of assets, liabilities, um, income sources, and then be conservative in your planning before you make a, a big decision to walk away from a career that was a source of your income for so long. Um, what I mean by that is, um, you know, sort of like ratchet down your expectations for what your portfolio might return. Um, round up on your budget to assume you might spend more um, than what you, your budget actually said you're going to spend, you know, round up, be a little more conservative, assume you're going to spend a little more, things like that, because inevitably these, these market events happen and um, we can't time them, we can't predict them. And so if you're conservative in your planning, that'll give you enough wiggle room to withstand these things when, when they happen. Um, so those are my, you know, my sort of thoughts on it. Deb, I don't know if you want to add anything. No, I agree with what you said. Definitely the budgeting and, you know, rethinking, you know, is, you know, where I'm going to spend and what are my priorities, you know. They do change a little bit, you know, after retirement. So, you know, rethinking that I think is very important. Yeah. And obviously, you know, you have to have a plan for health insurance, what yeah. you're going to do with Social Security, when you're going to take that. Um, so there's... You know, I'm sure if you if you uh, Googled, you know, retirement planning checklist, you probably find a bunch of good resources and, um, and and that'll give you, you know, things to help you get organized and prepare before you make that big decision. But just just remember, it's not all financial before retirement. A, a lot of it's psychological and your life will change. And uh, that can be easy for some people that that, that want to just like throw themselves into hobbies or family or things they haven't been able to do while they were working but for other people it's really really hard transition so you know there's books out there that help you know sort of explain other people's experiences with it it's it's worth doing a little bit of homework absolutely definitely i think the setting that mental expectation it's not a lot of people like you said that they have planned for retirement they have social security they have this but then what do i do how do i spend my day i think that kind of homework is also very important. How am I going to keep myself busy? You know, maybe get into some extra hobbies, some voluntary work, you know, getting a little more social, go out with, you know, but you have to keep yourself mentally occupied, you know, so you don't go into like, it's a, it's a life change. Yeah. And speaking of planning, Deb, uh, how do people plan for unpredictable expenses? Uh, set up emergency funds very important we always my manager always, so hard <laughs> that's you know be strict remember i told you about those coffee days that you that it's a need and a want sometimes you know just definitely have to have a you know life is unpredictable you might just need cash your car might break down something might happen and you need to have some funds put away that's liquid that you can have access to all the time Maybe just a savings account. We have, I know in our credit union, we have these accounts and members set up, give names to these accounts. And, you know, maybe just a separate savings account and, you know, label it as, as an emergency fund and keep it, but do not touch that money. Yeah, that happened to me last week. My car broke down. Thank God I had an emergency fund <laughs> to help me <laughs> get it together. Yeah, that's yeah. These things happen, right? They're, they're inevitable. I, you know, I, I always think of, um, 
the analogy I use is like tools in a toolbox or, or levers that you can pull, financial levers that you can pull. Um, so the emergency reserve is a great one, but just make sure you know what the other levers might be too. So, you know, like what is the line limit on your credit card? Like what are your, what are you comfortable pushing that to before you know you're going to need to carry that balance longer than you want? Um, maybe you don't have a home equity line of credit, but you could have one in place um, that you could use as an emergency lever to pull if you, if you had a, you know, a financial shock, That's a and, point. That's right? Awesome. I mean, there's lots of different resources out there. So just, you know, think about, again, like review your balance sheet, think about what you have, and then think about these different tools that you could have in your toolbox if something comes up. Um, okay. We have about 15 minutes left. So we have time to squeeze in a few more questions. Um, what do financial advisors do and how do I choose one? I know you know all about this, Patrick. Yeah. Um, wow. So, um, so in my opinion, um, personal financial planners, they, they help people uh, articulate their goals and objectives, which I think is a, is a big thing. You first got to kind of frame out what you're trying to do or what you want, what you want to accomplish. Having somebody help you with that, I think is important. Then um, an advisor can help you organize your financial resources, create that balance sheet, um, help you define your budget, and then they can help you develop a plan to achieve those objectives that you um, um, identified. And then not only that, hopefully the advisor will be able to then help you implement it. Um, and as I mentioned before, it's very rare that someone can create a plan put it into motion and then not have to adjust that plan. So I do think that there's like ongoing monitoring and evaluating and, and tweaking and refining of plans that are, that are really important. So an advisor can, can help with that. Um, the internet is a tremendous resource for uh, researching um, anything, including advisors and planners. Um, you can go out to these advisory firm websites, learn about their services, their investment philosophy, all those things. And many firms will um, provide uh, introductory calls or, or consultations at, at no cost. It doesn't hurt to start talking to different advisors. Um, you know, I encourage people to talk to friends, family, other professional advisors, like if you have an accountant that you work with or an attorney that you work with. You know, talk to them, see if they have somebody that they may recommend. But you know, there with an advisor, there is an opportunity to create a long-standing, trusted relationship that um, you know with a person that will ultimately know you and your family very well. So I think fit is really important. You want to spend a little bit of time with this person, make sure there's a good fit before you move forward. And um, one other thing I'll mention, I'll just uh, sort of plug the CFP designation. So that's Certified Financial Planner. Um, designation that if you're looking at a list of advisors and you see some with it, some without it, what the CFP designation indicates to you is that that person has gone through an educational program in financial planning. They passed a rigorous exam. Um, they have at least two years of relevant experience and they, you know, signed something that they're committed uh, to following the CFP Board of Standards Code of Ethics. So it's like a good first cut if you're looking for personal financial planning advice to look for the CFP designation. That's a great tip, thank you. Okay, and uh, we're gonna take this question and then start taking a few uh, live questions. This sure. one is, uh, when should I get a will and how do I start? Deb, you want me to take that one? Yes. <laughs> okay, so the, and, and all these questions are great. So um, I'd say the most common trigger for people to obtain a will is when they have children. That's usually when I see most people run out to get a will. Um, the will is a legal document that not only names the person that's going to be the personal representative of your state. Um, it used to be called the executor or the executrix. Now they call them personal representatives, but that person is the one responsible for um, seeing your estate through the process of settling your estate, but you also name guardians of minor children. And that tends to be the, the thing that most people are worried about and drives them to then getting the will. And it's, 
sometimes that can be, you know, we talked about peership and having open dialogue with your partner. Um, that can be a tough one to reconcile sometimes, you know, when one partner says, oh, I really want the guardian to be my mom or my sister or brother. And the other person says, no, I really want it to be my sister or brother because the X, Y, Z, it can sometimes be really hard for couples to get together and agree on that. And so sometimes they don't do anything because it's a hard decision to make. And what I always tell them is like, I'd rather have you make a decision, even if you're not 100% confident that it's the perfect decision. I'd rather have you make a decision and have a legal document that's binding and actionable than have the state you know, decide who's going to be the guardian of your children if something happens to both of you. So, so to me, the will um, usually is triggered by children. Um, and in terms of like how to get one, I, I often recommend people to attorneys. I just, I know there's a lot of online resources and tools at lower cost, but you know, I, my advice is to always seek out a professional when, when you're looking for, uh, um, a legal document. Um, there, there's a variety of attorneys out there. I would focus on somebody, um, or I would, focus on somebody that focuses on trust and estates work. There's lots of different law firms that do lots of different legal work. So find someone that does trust and estates work. And they usually run the gamut in terms of cost. So you should be able to find somebody that's within your budget to help you execute um, a will. All right, we have about 10 minutes left. We'll take our last question and then go to the live questions real quick. So the next question is, how can I become more confident in managing my money? Deb? I think knowledge you know if you have more knowledge about finances and if you then you know what more your options are attending seminars and you know going to maybe you know be financially educated that was going to become make you more confident you know about managing your money all right um we're going to take some of uh the live questions Someone has, does HUECU offer a cash back credit card? Deb? Yes, we do have all our, so we have three credit cards and we can, you know, we do have cash, we do offer cash back credit cards. Um, this is for you, Patrick. Someone talks about what is a, I, I can never say that word, pardon me, fiduciary? Fiduciary, <laughs> yes. <laughs> what is a fiduciary? That's yes. Fun. Yeah, a fiduciary is somebody that acts in your best interest, not their own. Um, that it's a great question. There's lots of different advisory firms out there, some of which will adhere to the fiduciary standard, meaning that um, you know they need to act in the client's best interest, which is what we do with the colony group. Um, or um, they may actually operate in, in a suitability standard as opposed to a fiduciary standard. And so, it, you know, for example, when they're making recommendations on, on products or, or even advice, it just has to be suitable. It doesn't like, you know, it doesn't have to be in their best interest. So um, I think it's important to, to ask that question. If you're interviewing advisors, you know, do you operate under the fiduciary standard or do you adhere to the fiduciary standard? So great question. Uh, another live one. Should I buy life insurance outside of what my employer offers? I'm happy to answer it, Deb. Do you want? Yes, you would get it. All right. Yeah. So uh, the answer is it depends. <laughs> um, like many things. Um, yeah. I mean, I think for, in my opinion, I think you know, starting with employer provided coverage where they're paying the premium. Um, you know, take advantage of that. If you feel like you need more life insurance than what you're getting from your employer provided coverage, then I think you want to look at, in my opinion, term life insurance, you know, go to an independent agent, someone that's not just going to sell you the products of their company, that their, their insurance company that they work for, an independent agent, and, and identify uh, the period of time in which you need coverage and how much coverage you need. And, and get term life insurance. It's the most inexpe uh, inexpensive and, and effective tool uh, for providing liquidity to your loved ones if, if you're not around anymore. Um, it's you know what's called whole life insurance. Um, very complicated, we don't have time for it. It just gets expensive. So if you're just looking for the most cost-effective way to have coverage for your loved ones, term life insurance. And you're usually better off doing that on your own and going back to your employer and asking for like more coverage from your employer and paying for your employer. 
Right. So this, you know how they're saying time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> time has flowed. So thank you so much, Patrick uh, and Deb, for joining us today. We are so happy and appreciate you squeezing us into your busy schedules. So um, I, I, of course, everyone, this is being recorded and you can go back and watch it if there is a, something that you want to know again. Um, Deb, and Patrick, again, I know you guys have a busy schedule and you need to get back to your schedule. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Take All right. Have you. a great day. You too. Tell me. All right. I'm back on camera, everybody. So um, one of the things we also wanted to um, let everyone know at the end, please take our survey. Um, it's huecu.org slash survey, really telling us how we did today, some questions you may have, and how we can be better, uh, really, to serve uh, your needs. And um, any thoughts and how we can be uh, better for you, just uh, put that in the survey um, as well. And also, um, this is uh, the first segment A, and then we have segment B coming up. Um, it's We also have Thrive. It's our financial wellness. So you can go on huecu.org org slash thrive and thrive really is a free personal finance resource it's our thrive financial wellness it's a one-stop shopping for financial education that we kind of put together so you can go there um, and some of you who want to stay and learn more you can join us at 1 p.m uh, eastern time and we'll walk you to through Thrive and just how it works. And um, also wanted to let everyone know that uh, this whole presentation today, this is for educational purposes. Uh, we hope that you take some next steps to reach your uh, personal financial advisor, uh, talk to him or her and figure out what some of your needs are. Uh, so hope that's one of the takeaways that we hope that you had uh, today. And uh, email recording um, of this will go out about next week. Uh, stay in touch with us on uh, LinkedIn, on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at myhuecu, and uh, any of our recordings, like I said before, it's on our YouTube channel, so you can watch it, and uh, you, we're going to take a quick little break, uh, you can get some water, and uh, the next uh, a part B of our presentation. It's going to be introducing Thrive, your financial education resources. So same link, um, just, you know, you can go to the bathroom real quick, grab some water. So our next session will start in about three minutes. And um, just, well, we're going to just uh, close. I'm going to turn my camera off and then I'll come back on in about three minutes. So it's a good little break. And for those of you who are leaving us again, this is going to be recorded so you can join us on our YouTube channel. Thank you so much for joining us and spending the time with us. And for those of you hanging around and joining us on the second part of our uh, summit, we really appreciate you and thank you so much for your patience. And again, thank you so much, Deb and Patrick, for joining us today. Have a great afternoon. Stay with us. We'll be right back in just a few minutes. <music> 